Dziś do grona doktorów honorowych Uniwersytetu Jagiellońskiego dołącza profesor Tomasz Sati, Senat Uniwersytetu Jagiellońskiego. W dniu 29 czerwca 2011 roku podjął uchwałę o nadaniu panu profesorowi tytułu doktora honoris causa. Ta decyzja Senatu pozwala na przeprowadzenie dzisiejszej uroczystości. Wielki to dla mnie zaszczyt i prawdziwa przyjemność wygłosić laudację na cześć profesora Tomasa Satiego, znakomitego uczonego, wybitnego intelektualistę i wysoko cenionego na całym świecie negocjatora rozwiązującego najbardziej doniosłe problemy polityczne, gospodarcze w oparciu o swoje teorie. Nos, rektor Uniwersytatis Jagiellonice Krakowiensis, de sententia senatus, die undetricessima mensis iunni, Anno bis millesimo undecimo, Facultate Gubernationis et Communicationis Socialis, Rogante Solemniter Lata, in Virum Doctissimum Atque Illustrissimum Tomam Sati. I'm greatly honored and pleased to be invited to Poland's best known and oldest university, Jagiellonian University in Krakow, the home of Copernicus, Pope John II, John to be awarded the degree of honoris causa doctor in the presence of University Senate, members of the Faculty of Management and Social Communication, and invite as guests, and also, of course, in the presence of my dear wife, Ever since I was a very young boy, I loved and was good at mathematics and had insights about its potential applications in the real world of both science and human and social life. My studies at Yale University and at the Sorbonne gave me very wide familiarity with the tools and broad concepts of the field of mathematics. Lucky for me, a new branch of mathematics, the field of operations research, was at its very beginning when I finished my university studies and began working in Washington for MIT and later for the Arms Control Disarmament Agency in the State Department. In 1959, I wrote the first book in the world on the mathematics of operations research, which was translated to Russian and Japanese. During the Kennedy and Johnson years, while I was at the agency, I gathered together a team of world-renowned experts who tried to use game theory to help in the negotiations with the Soviet Union during meetings in Geneva. Four of those experts later won the Nobel Prize in economics, Gerard de Breu, John Harsanyi, Reinhard Selton, and Robert Allman. These experts, though, had difficulty in applying game theory to nuclear arms reduction negotiations, not the least of which was the amount of time it took to come up with the measures and proposals to be taken to Geneva. In 1969, I left Washington to become professor at the famous Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, where I began to think about how people made decisions and choice. In wrestling with that problem, I arrived at the idea that all people in the world made decisions all the time, and many make successful decisions, and game theory was not in their blood. It had to be studied long and hard to be understood. But I said my grandmother was a very intelligent person who was very strong and decisive and did it without much schooling. I arrived at the conclusion that we all uh, were all biologically equipped to make choices through comparisons. Not only comparisons by obeying natural law, our consciousness and subconscious brains use comparison to determine what is important and what is less important. From our very beginnings, we have been doing that, but regrettably, comparisons have not made their way into our quantitative thinking and measurement. I'd like to elaborate here that reading that Plato, and later Aristotle, wrote down the laws of thought, and the laws of thought, they, they are three laws of thought from which all our logical 
the logic of thinking and mathematics have followed, but if you have a chance to examine them, they're missing an important element that's assumed, and that's things have to be compared with each other to be understood. You cannot understand this without seeing that, so you know it's not that. So in any case, uh, comparison has become a science and, and incorporated in mathematics. Uh, our conscious and subconscious brain uh, use comparison to determine what is important, what is less important. From our very beginnings, we have been doing that, and I, I mentioned that. In fact, we invented measurement long after we became civilized and have used them carefully in our scientific thinking only in the last 500 years. In addition, our brains themselves are quantitative in nature as they are made up of neurons that fire and synthesize these firings to make all that we respond to and feel and think and abstract. How do they do it? Our brains are the only instrument we have to understand everything. If we could explain how this mechanism works, we would spend less and less time on the chance of making discoveries because, may, may, because we may learn how to create the firings that result from whatever we choose to look into. Once again, let me thank the Jagiellonian University authorities and other distinguished professors and friends, Professor Casimir Goebel and Eloise Novak, uh, senators of their universities, who made this honorable occasion possible. I'm deeply grateful for your recognition of my academic research and also for elevating the field of knowledge I devoted all my professional endeavor to. Also, I would like to welcome all of you to my lecture taking place on Friday and Saturday. I will even tell some jokes, maybe. <laughs> then we will have a chance to discuss the analytic hierarchy process, analytic network process, neural network process methodology, and their application in details. Thank you very much. <laughs>